Now, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, welcome to our humble establishment, and we welcome you both in behalf of the Theosophical Society in America, uh, which uh, owns this building, and of our uh, Gnostic Church, which holds its services and other activities here as well. And so you are, uh, uh, you are extended a double welcome, which in turn we hope is welcomed by you. <laughs> in any event, uh, we are following a tradition of many decades um, with this meeting this evening, because uh, it was in the uh, 1970s uh, that we held our first uh, uh, annual prognostication by way of the Tarot uh, uh, meeting, and we had one every year since then. Uh, now, uh, it, it has been our custom for some time, which, however, I think uh, uh, we shall uh, allow to go into abeyance this evening, of uh, giving a sort of uh, little introductory uh, spiel about the nature of the Tarot, about its history and so forth. But it came to my mind, and hopefully uh, in, a, in an illuminating fashion, that if you didn't know about the Tarot, you wouldn't be here tonight. So why in the heck uh, repeat the information which in some fashion uh, you have already received before and uh, engage in that kind of a duplication. Therefore, we shall not do that. Let me just say that much, that the, the Tarot is a, uh, is a mysterious uh, um, occult instrumentality. Uh, not even the very word, the very name, has ever had an adequate translation uh, given. Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, weird conjectures having been made. And uh, in fact, the Tarot has a tendency to create uh, some uh, weird circumstances. One of the uh, uh, magical authorities of the uh, turn of the century in the early, early 20th century, who shall, who shall, I shall not name, uh, at this point, uh, then you already guessed who I'm talking about, uh, had said that uh, there is, are uh, entities connected with the Tarot. Uh, you know, us uh, occult people see entities everywhere, even when anti-entity is on the screen. Uh, but uh, that there are entities uh, that they are, um, uh, they are tricksters. They are a bit mischievous. Uh, of course, he should have known because that man was quite a trickster himself, a very important individual nevertheless. So uh, that being the case, uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that uh, with, as all tricksters, the Tarot is a mystery. Uh, and as I say, the uh, the very word itself uh, has never had a, an unquestioned uh, translation, uh, and uh, uh, that is probably apparently what the Tarot entity is like. Uh, uh, actually, the uh, fame of the Tarot and its rise to uh, uh, considerable uh, public uh, knowledge and acclaim did not come until the 19th century, uh, uh, maybe already a little bit at the, uh, toward the end of the 18th century, when the great uh, French uh, uh, giant of occult law, Eliphas Levy, uh, Alphonse Louis Constant by his civilian name, had uh, uh, published uh, very uh, fine information about the, uh, the correlation uh, and the relationship of the Kabbalistic tree of life and the paths or channels 
connecting the Sephiroth on the Tree of Life. And this gave the Tao a tremendous shot in the arm, as it were, and books and uh, various Tao decks uh, uh, have been published uh, in considerable numbers since then, and that interest in various ways, as we can tell by your uh, kind presence here, uh, have endured uh, to the present time. Uh, some of the uh, uh, translations or attempted translations of uh, matters relating to the Tao really have taken peculiar uh, turns. I will only mention one because fortunately having lived for about a year in, in the fair land of Belgium and for other reasons, I know some French. And then I saw a book here in English, although no doubt translated, by the truly great and prestigious uh, turn of the century French occult teacher Papus, and it is entitled, at least in the English heading, The Tarot of the Bohemians. And I thought to myself, the Bohemians are the people who live in Bohemia or Czech country, and then it came to me, the French name for a gypsy is Bohemien. And uh, that is why a translator is such an important person, you know. Uh, uh, it obviously, uh, a silly mistranslation occurred, uh, and uh, uh, that Bohemien was, uh, uh, was interpreted uh, as a, ro a wrongful translation of the gypsy. Now, it is true, and I come from, a, I was born and raised in a country which is noted for its large gypsy population, namely Hungary, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, the gypsy people, of whom I saw many ever since my childhood uh, in the countryside, that the gypsy population was, uh, uh, among other uh, arts and uh, crafts, also devoted to uh, the divination, or as its vulgar name has it, fortune telling, by way of cards, and that these cards were more often than not tarot cards. So the likelihood is, and I'll conclude the, I said I'm not going to do this and I'm doing it, uh, and you can see how, how that goes. But in any event, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the likelihood is that the tarot cards in some form, because various ancient decks have been discovered, that the tarot cards in some form were to say the least the ancestors of all the playing cards that are being used today, in, including the ones that are used for bridge or for whist or for various things. In, in Austria, in particularly, there is a popular deck which uh, is, has almost the same name, it's, and I, I have one of them, which is called the Tarok, T-R-O-C-K, and it's a direct more direct derivative of the original tarot cards than others. In any event, from somewhere, from the great mystery of uh, history, this uh, deck of cards has uh, come and survived, and uh, among uh, various uses uh, that it has been put, certainly there was also the and without that it probably would not have survived, the practice of what we call divination. Divination, or the debased form of which, or the debased name of which is fortune-telling, is the use of some instrumentality for the invoking of uh, insight and information uh, not ordinarily available, but in some secret and mysterious way accessible uh, beyond uh, our uh, daily lives 
uh, in uh, the realms of uh, occult and mysterious and psychic happenings. So that is really, uh, I think, an adequate general idea. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, at various times in history, probably the most important of these being in the 1960s, there were regular uh, uh, upwellings of interest of considerable uh, size and import in the tarot, and then great many uh, tarot decks have been uh, printed, uh, in addition to the few that were available, and uh, certainly not as one would expect, uh, not all of them of equal value and equal interest, uh, but still of some significance. And just like I don't know in the Middle Ages or in the time of the Renaissance, to this day, the uh, probably the most uh, frequent use of the tarot is for divinatory purposes, which is the, the uh, attempt on our part to uh, bring into our uh, mundane consciousness uh, matters which uh, otherwise are, he are uh, veiled from our sight and which for the most part pertain to the future. Uh, this, I'm, this, this is what I'm now going to say, is something that I think I repeated every time when talking about the tarot in whatever context, that while some of you are too young to remember, but of course, uh, uh, is anyone as old as I, I do remember, that we had a Hollywood prophet at one time. Uh, and, uh, and the Hollywood prophet, who, uh, I'll conceal his name at this time because maybe some of you remembered, but I'll, I'll give up the concealment. His name was Criswell. He probably had a first name, but nobody knew it. And Criswell had a very popular television program and was really quite an interesting man. Uh, and uh, um, one of his uh, uh, sayings which became sort of popular after he had voiced it, I think, on television, was that we are all interested in the future, because that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. <laughs> and then came Chris well predicts, Chris well predicts. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, Certainly not only Chris Will, but many, many people in all walks of life had, uh, um, had an interest in the future because uh, um, it is one of those uh, dimensions of reality that is ordinarily concealed from us. And therefore, if we gain uh, 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 some insight into it, we feel that we have been thereby enriched. Now, and that being the case, um, uh, there are, of course, many ways in which the tarot, the deck of tarot cards, which consists of 78 cards, pretty big deck, uh, uh, that the deck of tarot cards have been utilized. And that uh, uh, one of the uh, main ways of uh, thus uh, employing the tarot cards for the purpose of divination or uh, in a more lowly form uh, uh, fortune telling is uh, that uh, certain uh, ways of uh, laying out the cards after the cards being shuffled and so forth are taken to give an indication of future developments, usually of a person. Generally, you have an individual uh, going to a tarot reader and asking for a reading. And at that time, the tarot reader will spread out, uh, usually on some flat surface, what um, technically in tarot circles is called a spread because the cards are spread out according to a certain pattern. 
and the different portions of that pattern uh, are taken to be indications of uh, some aspect uh, that is developing or has developed uh, in the, the person's life or uh, in the life of the person who has come for a Tao reading. So now when we are doing a much more general reading, because these readings uh, uh, at early in January and that we have conducted for such a long time, have been for the purpose of uh, attempting to uh, gain some insight into the, the various uh, situations and developments in the United States of America. Uh, and I, I picked up that idea from uh, my greatly revered uh, teacher and employer of many years, Manly Palmer Hall, who always at this time of the year had several astrological readings at the Philosophical Research Society. One of them was the, the horoscope of the nation. And then there were in the individual horoscopes of people, which always amused us because I initially, one when he started that, I was there at the first session, uh, when he started that, he gave all the 12 signs of the zodiac in one lecture. Well, needless to say, it was uh, somewhat concentrated and confusing. Uh, and so th thereafter, he just had like maybe two signs one evening, two signs another evening. And those were really amusing incidents because let's say he, he just spoke about Capricorn uh, and then was going on uh, down the Zodiac and a whole bunch of people got up and left. The reason being those were all Capricorns. <laughs> when he came around to my sign Sagittarius, I was polite because I had great regard for Mr. Hall, and I still do, and I, of course, did not leave. But, you know, that's how you could tell uh, who was of what, which astrological sign. Well, with the Taro, it is somewhat different, but he also, the very first uh, uh, lecture that he gave uh, on uh, that cycle, in that cycle of subject, was the, the uh, horoscope of the nation. So therefore, we have also designed a reading for the United States, and that is the one at which you are um, uh, graciously present and assisting at the, at the present time. Now, uh, do keep in mind that uh, like all divinatory devices, uh, the tarot uh, impels and uh, illuminates, but does not compel or force either the future itself or our understanding of the future. Uh, uh, in other words, even though it doesn't look that way, he, you and I have to do a good deal of work uh, in our psyche in order to gain some understanding of what the Tarot is trying to tell us. If we are not involved, then we are not going to get much of a result. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, keep, your, uh, keep your divinatory sense sharp and uh, cutting, and then perhaps you will gain some significant uh, insights. Now the um, the tarot spread, the particular uh, way of laying out the cards that we use for this occasion is something that is called the uh, Celtic cross. And in order to uh, uh, begin the reading, what we need to do first of all is to uh, select a card and uh, the principle of random selections is extremely important here. We need to select a card which in this case will stand for the United States of America. When you're reading for an individual, then it is just for the uh, 
it is the individual's card. The way in on, on an occasion like this that we select that, that the cards have been shuffled a number of times before I came here, but that we uh, we try to employ the the principle of uh, uh, chance, and uh, therefore we cut the cards, and then we reassemble them in a new way, and uh, we have uh, decided many years ago that the, the uh, card that will symbolize, uh, in this case the United States, symbolize our uh, customer for whom we are reading, is done after cards having been shuffled, cards having been caught, and uh, the first uh, queen, because there are four queens in the tarot deck, uh, and the, the first queen that comes up in the bottom of the deck will be what is technically has been called the significator, uh, meaning the card that stands for the person, or in this case, the nation that asks the question. So here we are at the bottom of the deck, and I am looking for a queen, and uh, in this uh, in this world where there are so few monarchs left, uh, the queen is even difficult to find in the in the tower there. But we shall find her, uh, and we know that the great queen, whom uh, we all so many of us admired so greatly, has gone to her noble ancestors, but that. Uh, the British monarchy endures, and so do the, I think, the spiritual monarchies. Oh yeah, uh, Her Majesty is hiding quite a bit. Usually by this time we we got her, hmm? but she will be there. She'll be there. Here it is, the Queen of Wands will be our uh, significator, which means the card that stands as the symbolic representative of the nation, of the, of the United States themselves. And uh, here she is. Now, uh, the significator, uh, the main uh, issue being that it stands as the representative of the person, or in this case, of the nation that we are reading for. Uh, uh, and so it is, uh, we, we might say it is uh, a, uh, an overall theme of uh, consciousness, of mind, of, uh, uh, of uh, physical and spiritual characteristics that we may ascribe to the uh, United States of America and which are, would be involved in whatever happens to the United States. So we have the, significa the significator as the queen of wands. Uh, and uh, uh, why did we pick that? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time which was many, many years ago, and uh, essentially uh, uh, also uh, some of us, most of us, most of these persons having gone to the, uh, to the, the eternal hunting grounds over the decades, my friends who were, to, who were together with us at that time, we all had the feeling that there's something feminine about the uh, archetype and the archetypal psyche of the United States. Well, no, I know that the uh, uh, Uncle Sam has been represented as this comical character with a, a, a kind of a curious short beard, you know, uh, but also a top hat and various other things. So in the masculine form, 
But somehow, from a somewhat deeper perspective, that was our conviction. I think it was. To, and of course, what has been really the, the, the spiritual symbol of the nation for so long, the Statue of Liberty, the goddess of freedom. You know, uh, no one who has not come into New York Harbor as many of your ancestors uh, uh, have, uh, and very few of us have, I still have, has come into New York Harbor on a vessel, on a boat, uh, in the fog, and then looked at the Statue of Liberty emerging, holding up her torch, and has experienced the feelings that are attendant upon that, uh, can quite understand, I think, as to what a, a gigantic uh, spiritual symbol that Statue of Liberty is, and uh, how um, the presence, how there is a presence behind it. And without that presence, which was invoked by erecting the, uh, the statue here, I think much blessing has come up on the United States. So now we got to see as to what in the traditional uh, nomenclature in divination is called the covering card, which, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the major uh, uh, activations, I would say, of the tarot reading of consciousness. Because this we may wish to keep in mind, although once again it would take much much too much explanation to come close to it, that you know it is uh, no matter who we are reading for, and of course all the uh, the uh, tarot readers on Hollywood Boulevard and elsewhere are reading for somebody else because that is how they make their money. But uh, the uh, when we are when we are reading for someone else, ostensibly, uh, nevertheless, the reader is, uh, or should be, intensely involved in the reading, and so should the person whom we are reading for. So they both must uh, sort of extend uh, the uh, parameters of their own psyche to touch each other and to create the kind of interaction which might be uh, might be the the uh, originator of helpful disclosures in the de developments of the person and this ca in this case of the entire nation. So what we do now is we'll uh, keep picking up cards from the deck. The next card which will be the, which we refer to as the covering cards, is the uh, Nine of Cups. Now the, the Nine of Cups is a card of uh, satiation, of uh, having had too much. There is this corpulent fellow sitting there with a, uh, a sort of a, a, a counter behind him with all the, whatever you want to imagine them to be, cocktail glasses, wine glasses, brandy glasses, that would be my choice, uh, behind him, and uh, feeling very satisfied and very full. Now, uh, is that, uh, how our nation feels collectively? No. So does that mean that the Tao has lied to us? No. And what has what has happened is that the uh, we need to look a little bit on the uh, less easily apparent side of the meaning of the card. We are uh, we are. Uh, satiated 
not in a happy fashion, but in a sense, I think, that many of us in this culture, and uh, for fairly good reason, sort of had enough. We, uh, uh, we uh, are experiencing a life that is too much. We are having input of information, particularly, which is related to divination, that is too much. So in a sense, we might say that our life in this country, at least at this particular time, is sort of too much. And uh, so uh, the idea of being this uh, satiated person can mean someone not who is really happy about having all of these goods, but who is uh, in, a, in a condition wherein uh, he's, he's had enough, more than enough. And so there is a, a, an, an underlying uh, thirst. I use the word thirst because we are, in the card we are dealing with, with cups. We are thirsting for something in this country that we don't know how to define. And uh, that is a, a, a grave psychological predicament. Even the very uh, fact that we are using the term thirst and that the card indicates cups is of great importance because uh, we can, as we know, just from physiological data, we can live for quite a long time uh, without food, uh, or with very little food. But we cannot drink, we cannot live without drink. We cannot live, now I don't mean necessarily alcoholic drink, although I must say it, it helps. <laughs> it does help. Uh, you're not going to find a teetotal in this Hungarian, but uh, so there is a, uh, a phenomenon of uh, uh, having come to the, uh, the end of the road in terms of our experiences. We are, uh, we are bored with life because we had, we had experienced life to a great extent and degree and uh, perhaps what we have experienced wasn't very helpful. So uh, we are suffering from uh, too much experience, from too much technology, from too much science, and of almost anything that comes our way is too much. I mean, look, for instance, just a few years ago, uh, and that was one of the times when the Tarov didn't want to tell us anything uh, important, was when COVID was coming. And what happened then? We had, uh, uh, we, we always have, human race always has sicknesses, uh, you know. Uh, and all of us have had the flu at this, that, or the other thing. But when that sickness becomes a devastating epidemic, which has very significant psychological as well as physical effects, then uh, we might say that we had a little too much. The uh, uh, little too much virus, uh, like in that old uh, uh, church uh, uh, song that just it a song in school whereby religious matters have been sort of burlesqued. Uh, uh, let, us, uh, let us worship great Osiris. He will help us in a crisis uh, and he'll write us a papyrus mm -hmm. to save us from the virus. <laughs> So uh, let's say this, in fact, I added one of ISIS's uh, uh, things to it. So let's say uh, uh, we are, uh, we've had uh, the, the very uh, coming of a devastating epidemic 
is, is also an indication of uh, too much. It's something too much in too many things in the consciousness, too many things in the activities, too many things in the media, of course, especially there, uh, that we are uh, exposed to, and uh, uh, therefore that is our covering card. So uh, we shall see how the other cards, as they come along, may perhaps mitigate, uh, help us in that regard, and uh, help us to maybe work our f way through this plethora of experiences, plethora of images and ideas and imaginations that we are subjected to in our uh, culture. Uh, now, um, so the covering card being that of uh, uh, the nine of uh, cups. Underneath the covering card, usually placed in a horizontal uh, position, is what has been called the crossing card. And it has been indicated that uh, uh, this, this stands perhaps because of its position and the way it is placed on the, the general conditions in this case of the country, uh, it, uh, uh, it may indicate uh, an other dimension of consciousness, an, an, other, an alternative way of uh, exercising our minds than the covering card. So in the covering card, we are satiated. We have had too much. We have had too much riches. We have had uh, 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 too much publicity, uh, too, too much this, too much that, and perhaps too many of the wrong things. Uh, and therefore, we are filled up to here. At least I am. <laughs> and uh, after all, uh, I can regard myself as a paragon in that regard. So in any event, uh, from the covering card, but the crossing card may indicate forces of consciousness which uh, cross over that, which may uh, uh, bring in something else, uh, and which are of a different nature than the feeling of fullness of satiety and of boredom, uh, uh, which is uh, in, the, in this case in the significator and in the collective psyche of the, of the country. So now let us see what that, that crossing card may be. Oh dear, <laughs> oh dear. Well, <laughs> in any event, event uh, yeah, the crossing, I'll tell you, the crossing card is the eight of cups. Now, the Eight of Crops depicts, as you can probably see, uh, a person who is walking away. I mean, it's almost as if this is a continuation of the covering card. I very seldom have encountered something like that. So you might say, here he is, sitting with all the cops behind him and uh, probably drinking most of them. And now he got up and left the cops behind and is walking away. Now, of course, that's mythologizing about it because we have no, uh, no indication that it is the same person. <clears throat> but certainly it is the indication that uh, uh, there is an, an other force of consciousness that uh, uh, wants to turn its back on the plenty, on the overload, of so many things that we experience in this culture and that uh, is willing to turn its back and to walk away from it. Now this can be taken in several ways. You can walk away of something because you're disgusted with it. You may walk of, away from it because you feel that by taking a walk, you might encounter something to enrich your life and to add to these uh, uh, resources that you turned your back on. So it could, 
it could mean uh, just uh, continuing the uh, keynote that was set before, that we have too much and we are too much involved in too many things and that uh, this possibly is not a good thing. But in this case, we see that uh, there is something taking place and probably has taken place for some time that many of the many of the uh, preoccupations, uh, many of the activities uh, that we have been uh, involved with uh, has have yielded enough to us and <coughs> that we are moving in directions where we hope that we will uh, discover new and helpful things. Now this can be a good thing and this can be a bad thing. Because we don't know really what the gentleman, I think he's a gentleman, uh, with his red coat, uh, what he's walking toward. He may be walking toward uh, better things, he may be walking toward more uh, satisfying, more valuable experiences in life, or he might be walking toward the uh, dash, uh, toward, uh, toward experiences and ideas that uh, will not be helpful. And the, the nature of what he is walking toward is not given to us. So uh, I would suggest that both possibilities are there. Because the shallow psyche, the little soul, you know, there is being magnanimous and be, being pusillanimous. So the pusillanimous soul, the little soul, will walk towards things that are worthless will go to experience which will not avail him or her much and thereby keeps doing himself in. We all do it to some extent. We, we come into this world little, uh, little innocent babes uh, and then we subsequently uh, try to experience the world and uh, often uh, our ways of experiencing the world end up not very favorably to us. And we say to myself, oh gee whiz, I wish I hadn't had, hadn't had that experience. If I had known that, that's what I'm walking into, I sure wouldn't have continued walking. So now which one will it be? I would say at this particular point, although we may get further pointers, that uh, it could be either and that it is up to our people to uh, decide which way uh, they are going to go. And so it, it's the individual's decision, which is really what this country was founded on. This was, even when I was, uh, in, uh, was a little schoolboy school in knee pants, which you know we actually did well. Uh, so uh, I, I had gained the information from my father and others that the uh, United States was uh, a place where people went to have new experiences, to start a new life. Little did I know that I would be one of them, uh, as it came to pass. But, uh, but and, there, and there again, I mean, those who came to the United States, some of them became, in those days, a millionaire was, was really something, you know. Uh, now, uh, uh, it's, oh, I think that uh, you, you, it's the first qualification for a homeless, homeless person. Uh, you know, it, it, that's what a million has become. But let us say, uh, if we go up even to the higher uh, figures, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, acquisition of uh, wealth and of the means of procuring the, the wealth and the means of uh, utilizing the wealth was considered to be a very important characteristic of the United States. 
Now I leave it up to you whether that judgment still holds and whether it, uh, these tasks are exercised in a manner that we uh, consider to be good and honorable. But the, we see a, a turning from previously uh, uh, explored and utilized resources toward, toward the hills. Now, what's in the hills? Well, we know what's in the hills here. The coyotes, I don't think we necessarily uh, seek uh, intimate encounters with those babies. And you know, sometimes you see them walking by here, you can see their shadow. But in any event, uh, there is a, we are apparently living at a time when uh, the desire to have new experience, a new way of dealing with reality comes into play. And so this is a turning point. But you know, a turning point uh, can be uh, helpful, or if uh, the turning is in the wrong direction, a turning can be disastrous. So I would say that this is an important thing to remember, that as we uh, turn our back on what has been, we should be discriminating and wise in choosing what shall be. Otherwise, what shall be will be as bad or worse than what has been. So once again, that, that inconvenient keynote, that the individual is important, that the individual judgment will matter, that the individual aspiration will be the important thing, it, I think arises out of this particular card. Now uh, we are moving into the card that is below the cross that we are laying, and uh, 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 in the fourth position, which uh, uh, has usually been associated with some uh, element of the past uh, that uh, uh, is uh, still lingers on, it's still present. So it's the past and uh, the past that comes from a distant past, but still has a considerable importance. And what we have uh, in that position is the major arcanum of the moon. One term that some of my friends gave to this position uh, in the spread is the lingering past. Well, whether it lingers or not, it is a, a past of some uh, background, of some history and that whether we like it or not is still here. So what can we say uh, about the moon? First of all, it's a major arcana. The major arcana in my estimation uh, come rather close to, if indeed are not identical with what uh, uh, one of the other people whom I admired all for so many years so greatly Carl Gustav Jung, the psychologist called architect. The 22 uh, uh, cards of the major arcana are of a deeper and more abiding and more powerful psycho-spiritual force than the others. So let, and they're very deep, they go very deep. You, you can't just fluff them off. You can't just say, oh, well, I don't want to deal with that. A major arcanum will stand there and say, you've got to deal with me. You've got to look at me. You've got to talk to me. You've got to, to know if you can with a bit of gnosis as to who I am. And so that's the kind of card we have here as far as the generic nature is concerned. Magnitude. We have a giri scene. In the sky is the moon in three of its, uh, maybe even more, certainly three of its phases shining down serenely. And there are two uh, 
uh, canine or a vulpine looking, one of them probably more of a fox, fox-like, the other one definitely a canine creatures who are howling at the moon as indeed they are wont to do. Out of a body of water there is a, a shellfish uh, looking like a lobster crawling out and, and crawling onto a road which leads into the distance. Two, uh, two mysterious illuminated pillars in the back and there are seeds that could be seeds of light, could be tears, could be blood uh, proceeding from the moon and falling onto the earth. Now, how can we deal with this one? I think that it is that uh, the, the lingering past, the, the long, that which is chronologically long past, but which psychologically is still here, calls out to us. And it is the lunar uh, mystery. It is the, uh, it is the light, what is the moon? The moon is the, the light of the night. It is the light that shines in the darkness, not not from the Gospel of John, but it is, uh, uh, and it is therefore, uh, this is a card of mystery, and it is a card of uh, mysterious forces, mysterious uh, items coming to the fore, coming out of the waters, which is the unconscious, and moving toward this, uh, strange source of light which is in the sky. So it's a, it's a card of mystery. It is not uh, a card of danger, but it is, uh, it is definitely a very occult card. And uh, now I think we gain maybe a little bit of insight as to the direction that that man in the red coat in the previous uh, class was walking toward. What we are walking toward is uh, a mystery. Uh, we are, there are mysterious things coming out of the unconscious. There are mysterious things in the sky. And there are creatures of the earth which howl at the moon, which salute uh, the mysterious thing in the sky. So here's a new keynote. And once again, this could indicate <coughs> very helpful things. It could indicate uh, uh, dicey and somewhat dangerous things. All of these will be up to us to decide. So I think depending on our attitude, depending on our vision, what is happening here, the, the the light from the night shining moon, uh, the, uh, the biological life that is turning toward the, the, the light of the night, and also the, the definitely, I mean, you know, a, a shellfish, a lobster, uh, a crayfish is, is a weird looking creature. But some of them taste pretty good too, mm -hmm. you know. But they're weird. Look, I mean, if you want something that looks really, really weird, mm -hmm. uh, a shellfish does it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the unexpected, the weird, the peculiar, is coming out onto dry land and moving toward an unrecognized objective, but which has some connection with the mysterious light of the moon. So something mysterious, something not at all rational, not at all scientific, not at all PhD, uh, is coming out from the deeps, and it is still keeps coming. And this is, uh, let's say, the, the more hidden component of, of uh, the process that is taking place. So uh, let's put it this way. If you are interested in occult things, if you are interested in the sort of thing that uh, 
Theosophists and Rosicrucians and, and similar weird, weird folk have always been uh, interested in, then uh, take heart, because uh, in the midst of this uh, strange cultural changes, some mysterious things, some the occultus means hidden, some things that have been hidden, and some things that carry a, a, an order than rational, and certainly other than political significance is coming out into the open. And who knows, maybe this factor will save the day and take us away from uh, so much of the balderdash that we are preoccupied with and that we are being fed by, fed by media and which uh, markedly already at its beginnings is doomed to failure. So uh, maybe there is, there is a hidden factor which psychology would call the unconscious that is coming into play and it's old. Of course it's a lingering past. It has been there for ages. It has been there for centuries. It has been there for millennia and even longer. But it is coming. It is moving. It is uh, stirring up nature and perhaps our own nature. I would say that to my weird way of looking at reality, uh, this, uh, uh, this particular card which is at the bottom of the uh, of the Celtic cross is perhaps the, the most interesting and in many ways the most hopeful of the cards that we have seen so far. Now then, oh, all right, her I like. <laughs> uh, so now we go to the more recent past, uh, um, and that is uh, over on this side, and. Uh, uh, this is, a, this is always a strong card because it, has, uh, it is something that has happened already or that uh, has appeared to us in some form, but that is really powerful and its influence endures. So what do we have there? We have the Empress. Uh, now the Empress, uh, uh, of course, uh, is one of the prime uh, feminine cards of the Tao, uh, equal perhaps only to the high priestess, and uh, has some relationship to nature, but on the whole is uh, a, uh, uh, let's say, the, the prominent, uh, the insightful, uh, the, the wise aspect of feminine nature. So what has happened? within the last, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, half a century or so. The feminine has definitely called attention to itself, and others have called attention to it. So um, uh, we have in our midst a, a wise and at the same time very mellow and very uh, kindly because uh, the Empress is a much more uh, kindly card than, say, the High Priestess. Being of a priestly disposition and profession myself, I, uh, I obviously like the High Priestess, but uh, the Empress is going to be nicer to you than, than the High Priestess. So, um, let's say the I would say this may have something to do with the feminist era, within various ways in which the feminine principle has come into prominence in comparatively recent times, because it is the recent past. And uh, I think that uh, the greater the, her influence, and you see, you see on her shield is the, is the, uh, is the sign of Venus. So she has to do with love, she has to do with kindness, she has to do with naturalness, and uh, she bears the, the crown of the stars of the ancient wisdom on her head. So 
not only weird things uh, and bad, almost bad things have happened uh, in with all the cops and things like that, but something very good has happened in comparatively recent times, and that is the influence of the empress, and that influence should be cultivated and understood. All right. Now we jump on the other other side of the the, the cross, where this is now what uh, you've been waiting for, and this is what, uh, of course, our Hollywood prophet Criswell uh, was talking about the future. Mm -hmm. So now we're placing our foot for the first time on the future, and understandably the near future. So we're not talking about something that we'll have, we'll have a couple of hundred years from now, but that may happen now. Uh, and the near future will be, let's see what it will be. Oh, my goodness, another lady, the Queen of Cups. Now, uh, the Empress and the Queen of Cups together, this I like. Because this would be, you see, the, the Queen, you know, Cups is the original suit out of which the suit of hearts in playing cards develop. So it has to, the Queen of Cups definitely has to do with love, with affection, with kindness, with all sorts of things of this sort. And so uh, this is the near future. So I would say that uh, uh, those who are interested in the romantic side of life, which I think is true of all of us, because this is one of my heresies when I uh, uh, depart from 19th century, from the, at least the formulations of 19th century occultism, that uh, in order to be an occultist, in order to be a theosophist, an anthroposophist, a Rosicrucian, whatever they may be, you have to be first of all a romantic. The, a lot of the people in the 19th century got it wrong. They wanted to turn everything into a science. Rudolf Steiner, whom I greatly respect, otherwise he was a one was spiritual science. science. Come on, Herr Doctor. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is, we are not dealing here with uh, 19th century science. We are dealing here with a mystery. And what you have to do in order to approach the mystery, you have to feel it. You have to feel it. Thinking hasn't got us very far. <laughs> thinking has got us to nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, thinking has brought us to uh, terrible, uh, terrible revolutions and, uh, and uh, uh, um, revolutions and things of that sort, right up to the present time. Think the, the overactivity of the thinking <coughs> function have, hasn't brought us much good. But the heart, the cup, uh, the feeling, especially when it is turned to worthy objectives, can be of very great help. So I think that this would indicate that in the near future, uh, uh, and something that we should concentrate on is kindliness, love, good, good naturedness, and uh, a, uh, an accepting, uh, an accepting attitude, especially toward other forms of consciousness, toward other people. If we can do that, I think that as uh, uh, some of the depth psychologists. Uh, have, you know, I'm thinking particularly of one uh, uh, of, whose name will come to me, have indicated in the feeling function there is a, a treasure. And it could be that in the relatively near future, let's say within the next hundred years, this treasure may be uh, discovered because the, the Queen of Cups holds a treasure. She holds a grail. She holds a, a mysterious, mystical chalice uh, while her feet are on the shore of the ocean. So I would say the next few decades 
if we take advantage of it, we might get very uh, helpful and very uh, transformative and insight-producing uh, feelings. So I would say next, next 20 years, next 30 years, uh, I'm afraid that it's, go it's a little bit too far ahead for my advanced age, but in any event, just even the next few years, concentrate on the Queen of Cups. Concentrate on love. Concentrate on kindliness. And uh, if you do that, you will greatly reward it. So that is the near future. And now then we are moving up to the top of the Celtic cross, um, which is really, the, I think, the seventh uh, position. Uh, and uh, what we have there is the more distant future or the, uh, the uh, continuing of the future, the continuing uh, uh, development of what we have already seen in its earlier stages. So let's see what we have for that position. Oh, oh yeah. Then, huh? No, I don't want two, I don't want one, only one two. All right, so uh, what we have now is the, uh, the more distant future. I, I still call it that. Um, but where the more, you know, what's more distant and what's more close is very much up to the uh, individual. Um, when you are uh, 20 years old, then being 21 is the, the, the near future, you know? Oh yeah, oh, and it, it, it's, it will reveal so many great things to you. You are no, now an adult, even though your mind is still as stupid as it was before. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But in any event, that's really not the, the part of the thing is here in the, in the, in the future, which is beyond the, uh, beyond the next 20, beyond the next 30 years, we have the uh, city of pentacles. And I believe that uh, this is the first pentacle, actually, that uh, has appeared so far. Now, as you, as many of you may recall, the pentacles uh, relate to the element of earth, and they they have to do with uh, well, they have to do with physical things uh, in the sense of. Uh, uh, how our consciousness can engage with outer reality. And the card that we picked being the three of pentacles, I think is, is of some importance. But once again, I, I call attention to my romantic proposition. We had uh, two of the most romantic cards of the tarot, namely the Empress, and uh, our dear friend, the Queen of Cups, uh, and out of these, now a pentacle. And this, this, this pentacle, this particular card of pentacles, the three of pentacles, is a card of construction. I mean, not necessarily of buildings, although that's the symbolism, but it means that we we have within, within us the the creative uh, uh, power to build. And that's very, uh, uh, very helpful to me and I'm very glad about that because architecture is one of my great loves. Uh, no wonder uh, C.G. Jung's uh, only son, uh, Franz Jung, engineer Franz Jung, was an architectural engineer. He didn't become a psychologist, he was an architectural engineer, because uh, to me architecture is the, uh, the, the way in which uh, beauty in such a magnificent way has been brought into human life and into human consciousness and uh, has endured. Well, anything from this side of the pyramids is architecture. And look how important it still is. Look how people uh, strive for the, the power and the beauty and the, 
and the glory that human consciousness out of the element of earth has made and whereby it has enhanced the beauty of life on earth and our ability to appreciate that beauty. So it would seem to me that uh, in, the, uh, in the more distant future, uh, we, are, uh, we may become more constructive in the actual meaning of the term. But I, I uh, bring back the note that in order to be constructive, in order to be the new uh, Leonardo da Vinci's and Raphael's of this world, we first have to feel. If you read uh, Irving Stone's marvelous, marvelous book uh, uh, um, about, about uh, the, the Renaissance artists and so forth, you will see that they have to, these people were people of very intense feelings who had the ability to translate those feelings into art. And uh, perhaps uh, in the more distant future, that is something that may occur to us. Now we are, have actually completed the, the Celtic cross, and some people might think that that's enough. But uh, actually, uh, there is uh, a, a, uh, an, or, an organized structure of four cards, which is up like, a, like one of the pillars of Solomon, or, the, or the just one, one side of the structure that is extremely uh, important. Because in it, we find uh, um, well, in some ways, perhaps more the uh, the internal development of the human psyche within this period. Although everything else is has also to do with that, but the four there are uh, are very important. I would say psychologically speaking, and so we start from the bottom, uh, uh, where we have. Uh, uh, a, a very important position. Now, my uh, uh, my view of uh, that position in the Tarot spread is probably not the same as that of others, but I would say that it is uh, it is the it is the voice of something very important, the voice of what Carl Gustav calls the self. So the a uh, a deity, a, a, an influence, is rising from the depths and will help to inspire and to transform our lives. And that particular influence in this case is char characterized by the most loving of all the tarot cards, namely the Two of Cups. So uh, it would seem that uh, you know, maybe one of one thing that we have been all missing and still are with all of our, all of our preoccupation with sex and gender and uh, and uh, this and that, we have forgotten love. And it would seem that both uh, the empress and the high priestess, and now uh, the card of the lovers, the two of cups, point to that. So this is the. Uh, the voice from the deep, but it is the voice of uh, of, the, of a deific voice. And just like earlier, we said that we can only deal with some of the influences that we saw if we listen to our feelings, if we uh, cultivate our feelings, and if we turn our feelings toward good things. Now we have uh, the arising from the unconscious of uh, the all-powerful and uh, certainly uh, most welcome phenomenon of love. Uh, I know that it's, it's easy to appear as a, a sentimental goof when you sing the praises of love, but whatever you want to call it, love, affection, uh, sympathia, 
all of the if we if these things are not cultivated mightily uh, then the opposite forces the dark forces the, the martial forces the cruel forces really will overtake us so I have they have no doubt in my mind that even by way of these few cards that there is a there is a great need this year and probably for a number of years to come to first of all affinitize ourselves to our feelings become more feeling toned individuals you know you can only do so much with the physical we know that for one thing uh, I have found out by way of the happenstance of a, an exceedingly long life. Here you are, the physical. Oh, yeah, oh when you're long, young, you know, you run, run into the hills, you step on the rattlesnakes, uh, uh, which we can do very easily here. You play with the coyotes, which will bite your hand. Uh, but uh, let's say, you know, you can do all kinds of things that are on the active and on the physical side. But then you, you must look at some, some, of, some of the factors that are deeper. And among these deeper ones is the, the romance of life and indeed the love of life. So I think that uh, the coming forth of the two of cups um, in, at this point of the uh, the unconscious, on on where the voice of the, the the true self from down below calls out is extremely important, and so there will be an opportunity, I think, in our well, probably not in my lifetime alone any any longer, but there will be an opportunity for most of us who are here to uh, call forth something very beautiful very pleasant, very ennobling from the deep of the unconscious. Because as certainly many have pointed out, in the collective unconscious, there rests a mystery. And that mystery is what Carl Jung called the self. And it is when the love of this internal deity of this uh, star that has been placed into us by the highest heavens, when that is cultivated, is beginning to come into its own. That's very good, very good news indeed. Now we are moving upward, and we are coming to uh, uh, the second from the bottom uh, card, and uh, which. Uh, is of a more practical nature. And uh, it indeed has a practical card associated with it, because here we have the king of pentacles. We didn't have, we didn't have many pentacles. So what does that mean? Uh, I would say it means that when we have learned how to feel life, and then we have learned how to love, love life as well as love other people, then by way of invoking these forces, we uh, will, and I will probably have to uh, defer to the new thought metaphysicals, as I like to call them, you know, the metaphysicals, yeah, uh, that uh, our physical nature and our uh, ability to deal with the physical world and perhaps even our physical well-being will be thereby enhanced. But look how much it's got to go through. So it's not the simple-mindedness of the simple-minded metaphysical who says, oh well, I'll, I'll make uh, uh, declarations, invocations, uh, uh, meditations on health and I'm going to be the, the healthiest son of a gun in uh, Hollywood. It uh, doesn't work that way. You know, that's, that's not the issue. What it means is that certain qualities, qualities of goodness, qualities of kindness, qualities of love, have to 
rise within us and that will then reflect itself in the physical too. We may, uh, our physical uh, wealth, our, our material goods may be few, but what we have will be of a kind that we can enjoy. What we have will redound to our benefit and will be important to us and through us perhaps to other people because that is to a great extent what the King of Pentacles declares. We, we will obtain a, a, a royal uh, power over the physical by way of having experienced and cultivated the feeling, and the love, the, the sentimental side of life. So we will all be sentimental millionaires, billionaires, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, if the billions won't be there, at least the good sentiments will be there. They are worth a great deal, a great deal as well. So the, uh, uh, the experience of uh, uh, the, the, the physical which can be uh, connected with our deeper nature is present there. Now we move upward and we are coming perhaps almost to the opposite uh, pole of uh, being, namely to consciousness, awareness. And hasn't really all of this been about consciousness? I think it has. Because I think that uh, the Tarot uh, like everything of a truly important and helpful nature in this world is here to make us conscious. Make us conscious. If you encounter some experience and you can't uh, squeeze uh, real consciousness out of it, walk away from it. Walk away from it. It may be valuable in other respects, but we are here to become conscious. And when once we have become conscious, then we will have heard perhaps that mysterious world that was heard in the temples of Egypt where according to some uh, perhaps imagination the Tarot originated and it will say, yes, now you know. And because you know, you know that you are part of the divine. That the need, the, the, so there is a possibility here of real gnosis, of real awareness in this particular, but you see how late it comes. So don't lose, uh, don't lose your determination, don't lose your, uh, your luck, uh, don't lose your, your desire to become more, because you know, that's what we are really here for. Everything else leads to that, to become more conscious. And this is what some psychologists, some very famous ones and some very good ones have called, it is the search for meaning. The grail in life is meaning. It is not intellectual meaning that this means that, but it is a, a meaning that can also be defined as consciousness. A meaning that, a meaning that Gautama has called enlightenment, and that uh, others have called by other names. So there is a possibility when we go through all of these, and in this particular year, to attain to greater consciousness, this can become a year of gnosis, which a word that the deep meaning of so, some of us uh, is familiar and is being studied by some of us. We can become aware of very important, very helpful, very uh, uh, empowering and transformative elements if we reach to this, this point. But again, look at the rest of it all. Uh, what played a tremendous amount of uh, uh, role, a tremendous role in this reading, and we're not, we, we still have one coming. Uh, you know, uh, what, what has played such a great amount of it was feeling, 
and kindliness and love. Why? Why? Because the, from these, uh, uh, these items of, con of experience comes good consciousness. From hunger for power, from envy, and you know what, what reigns over so much of the world now too is what? It's a, a teachings of envy. He has something and I want it and therefore I'm going to take it from him. This, this has happened over and over and over again and if somebody resists, then kill him. 40 million people, more than 40 million in China alone with, with, with Mao Tse Tung. Because when we don't have kindliness, when we don't have love, when we don't have a, a recognition of our underlying mysterious and yet extremely powerful relationship to each other, then we haven't got anything. We may have money, we may have power, we may, <coughs> we may have uh, uh, an entrance uh, <coughs> to the White House, or to some other colored house, which is, is all for nothing. And that is why uh, uh, the New Testament and uh, Buddhism and various others all emphasize the great need for these feeling tone developments. But anyway, in the awareness of our consciousness is very, very uh, important. And we haven't got it yet, have, have we? All right. So what do you suppose the, the, uh, the, uh, this particular card is? It is the star. Well, the star is really uh, uh, sort of the... The star is something that is inside of us. <laughs> it, uh, it shines. It, and it takes us to the cradle of Bethlehem as it did the, the, the three magi. The, car, the star is both a light bringer mm. and a, uh, a uh, guide. I think the, the star in many ways here is the, the crowning achievement that as the result of our having become affinitized to uh, the, the great life, not just life, it's very easy to say, oh, I, I, I revere life. But what about the, the life beyond the life, the great life, the ultimate life, the life that never goes away, the, li the life that ever goes stronger, which is the life of life. And so we have the, the star which shines over the, uh, over the life by way of our cultivating our good feelings, cultivating our love, cultivating kindness, cultivating compassion, we eventually arrive to a tremendously important uh, guidance, the guidance that comes uh, from the star. And uh, this is the star that is within us and that has to come forth. And in many ways, all the other cards that we looked at are uh, steps in that direction until we come to the point where we find the star. And the star will continue to guide us in this world and in the next. And now we have only one more to go, the future, and the final outcome. The final outcome in some ways, at least in my humble experience, sums up the entire reading. It, it, in many ways, it, it, it sums up our relationship to faith and to the tarot. So in some ways now, with the final outcome, which is the Ace of Cups, uh, we, we have, we sum up really the major uh, expressions of the transcendental will, which I hope that we have seen manifest in the various cards. The Ace of Cups, of course, is uh, the ancestor of the Ace of Hearts, uh, and uh, 
it is the the grill, the the most powerful container of uh, light and life and especially of love. This is the the supreme source of love and compassion and kindness and mercy. You know, it is. I I don't. I am not pushing any religious point of view, but I. Uh, by observing, let's say, the, the religious life in the world, uh, this reminds me of uh, a very important development which is very, very powerful in many parts of the world, which is the Divine Mercy Movement, which has popped up within the last few years in the Roman Catholic Church and has already created a wonderful counterweight to the uh, bumbling uh, uh, materialism into which the church itself has fallen. Uh, and so, you know, it, namely the mer I mean, I, I, I have to give several lectures on the subject, so I, I can't go into it, or I will, but let's say the, the what in the French is called merci is much more than what the English word mercy uh, indicates but it indicates that there is a, a, a tremendous force of benevolence and goodness and forgiveness uh, and uh, the, uh, the kind of compassion that elevates the object of compassion in this world. And if we are able to come to it, then we have really found the Holy Grail. So the, the summing up of... Uh, uh, tonight's reading with the Ace of Copies that something very marvelous will come because this is, of course, it, it's the suit of hearts that developed out of this. That something uh, of a, again, based very greatly in feeling but going way below, beyond the ordinary limits of feeling, something very good, something very helpful, something very lovely, something very glorious is trying to come through in this world. And uh, the question is, will we be there aiding it? Will we be there helping it? Or will we stand in its way? If we go along with so much that is being cultivated in the world nowadays, political, technological, everything else, uh, we, are, we stand in its way. But somehow I think the Ace of Cups and the, the, the Grail, the, the heart, the Sacred Heart wants to come forth, wants to take over, wants to become the determining factor again and the opportunity for many of us will be here this year. Everything in this reading points toward it. And uh, I have seldom been so moved and so happy by any reading that I did or interpreted before. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for having come and to ha help to make this possible. God bless you.